We are in the midst of examination of the firearms expert who's been getting some really interesting questions by members of the jury. David Icebrook is here to talk about this case with me. David, good to see you. You're a trial attorney here in New York. Aaron, great to be back. Good to have you back. Okay, so we're getting questions about whether or not the gun could go off without pulling the trigger because, of course, the accusation from the defendant is that the gun somehow went off. He's not quite sure. He says it was an accident. The witness just said that the only way it would go off without someone pulling the trigger would be for the hammer to have been broken. He said he tested it and the hammer was functioning just fine. It wasn't broken. So some pressure was exerted on that trigger if we're to believe this testimony. This is a great insight to what the jury's thinking right now. It's really the only time during the trial that you're going to get an insight to where the jury is because it's not very often that you can hear from a jury in the middle of a trial. It's only recently that they were even permitted to ask questions in criminal and in some civil trials now as well. So you can see they're focusing on the reality or the possibility of whether this gun could have gone off as they suspect the defendant would testify. Yeah, they're asking the right questions. They want answers. And if the answer doesn't suit the defendant's narrative, it's, of course, more likely that we'd get a conviction here. Yeah, I mean, I still think it's a high hurdle um, for a conviction here, as I've been saying when I was here last week as At well. At least as to the top charge, I yeah, would agree. To the top charge, yes. I mean, you still have him in the back seat. He fired it into a very thick upholstered uh, seat. He didn't know where it was going to land. He didn't know the likelihood. He wouldn't even have known if his wife was going to hand the gun back to him. So to, first of all, establish premeditated, the gun, of course, was in the front seat. She was passing it back to him when she asked for it. But these questions are very telling. It, it's, it's showing us that the, the jurors are very interested in the likelihood of when this gun could have gone off by itself. Maybe they're overlooking the other facts right now. and Obviously, they're focusing in just on the gun um, going off. Well, look, that's the heart of most of the case. Okay, The motive, they don't really need to prove the motive in order to get to the top charge in Georgia. First-degree murder in Georgia doesn't require motive. Of course, it's nice to have it, but they've got to prove intent. Did the gun go off intentionally? Did he intend to actually kill his wife? That's the big question. And you still have the felony murder charge here that if they conclude that it was a felony, the act of having the gun at that time or whether it was being... Uh, handled appropriately and there was a murder ensued, he could still be convicted of felony yeah, murder. We're going to take a quick break here on the Law and Crime Network. We're going to be back with more live testimony in just a moment. Welcome back, everybody. You're watching a live picture from the Tex McIver courtroom in Atlanta, Georgia. A defense attorney arguing a point. The judge has said that they're going to take a 10-minute afternoon break, so I think the jury's out of the courtroom at this point. So let's continue to analyze some of the evidence as the state's case marches forward here. David Icebrook, one interesting part of this prosecution that we were just talking about is the different sort of charges that the defendant faces. You have murder and then you have felony murder and I know that you've done a little bit of homework on that just as to exactly how they're trying to get to that top charge because there's a couple of different ways. One is to get there directly and then one is to get there indirectly. Right. Under the felony murder he's also been charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. If he's convicted of aggravated assault and there was a murder in um, conjunction with that felony it becomes felony murder and then he's ultimately convicted on the murder under the felony murder rule in Georgia as with most other states as well. You know, it's an interesting theory because normally when you see this felony murder rule there's one crime and then someone dies as a part of it. We were talking about the textbook example is if there's a bank robbery and then someone is killed in the uh, perpetration of the robbery, well, then people who plan the robbery are guilty of the felony murder. That's how it usually works. Now, here, are they trying to say that because the gun went off and struck the wife, that even if all they can prove is that lesser charge, that it's automatically felony murder because she died? Yeah, they're almost saying that the inherent crime here, the underlying crime of, of him shooting his wife, is also aggravated assault um, with a deadly weapon. So if they're trying to build the case that he was more negligent, and maybe they should have brought in a negligent charge here also, of uh, the way he was handling the gun, or the gun went off, they're trying to convict him on that lesser charge. Get well, to the murder. That's one of the big questions, too, because the lessers would be a lot easier to get to in this case than the top charges. So I want to listen to some of the previous testimony here to get you caught up. Of course, prosecutors have been saying that this is a financial motive. There were a lot of questions back and forth about 
the status of the victim's finances and the defendant's finances. They were married. They kept separate finances, however. They married later in life, not terribly uncommon for what law firms would call sophisticated clients. But look, there were other questions that were a little bit more strange, and let's listen to some of that testimony. So can you tell the jurors, um, while you were down on that level and you saw Mr. Hickey and Austin and the defendant on his phone, did the defendant say anything to you at that time? Did y'all have a conversation? Yeah, we kind of tossed the, we were tossing, tossing the football while, uh, while he was on the phone and then he, uh, he apparently finished his call and he and I kind of gravitated toward one another and um, right there while Austin and Jim continued to throw the football and Tex and I had a conversation. Okay. And can you tell the jurors, what did he say to you at that time? Um, he, he asked me if I knew anything about uh, Social Security and Social Security checks. Is that all he said to you? Well, um, he asked the question, and I kind of made a joke, and I said, "Well, I, I know I'm not old enough to collect Social Security yet." And, and uh, he said, "Well, I, I was I was just wondering about Diane's Social Security." And. Uh, and he, he, he went on to say, I was just wondering if I, if I could collect her checks now. And I told him I, I didn't have any idea I could find out, but I, I, I had no idea of, uh, whether he could. In fact, I, I think I went on to say, I, I, I guess you can, I, but I don't know. And, and he said, well, he would, he would find out. So that was a individual who worked with the victim, and he's talking about a conversation that he had with the defendant. The defendant, ultimately, David, apparently wanted to collect the victim's Social Security checks here. Now, we keep hearing about wills and what's going to happen to this ranch that the couple owned and whether or not they wanted to change their wills. You know, but now you have another element of money that's been injected into this, and, and it's a bit bizarre. I'm not sure, Aaron, if uh, this exchange between the defendant and this gentleman was after he was charged um, or shortly in the period when he was being charged. But it's a classic example of an attorney not thinking like an attorney. Because an attorney is certainly not going to have a conversation which they know can come back and hit him in the rear at a trial um, or a deposition. And at that point, he didn't know how far the case was going to go, what was going to be charged with, if he had been charged. If he had been charged already, and he's having this conversation with this guy, then the, you know, the defendant just wasn't thinking at the time. For an, an attorney knows, um, an experienced attorney expe uh, especially, is that any conversation or any contact they have with anyone involving the case, they're going to be spoken to by the prosecution. Yeah, you know, so maybe the defendant had loose lips here, but look, we've heard some of the financial experts saying, look, this guy was a high roller, he made a lot of money, and he spent a lot of money. So I want to continue listening to some of the testimony from that uh, friend, uh, that uh, co-worker, because there was another odd conversation about the disposition of the vehicle where the shots were fired. Okay, now having, having had the opportunity to review your notes, is your memory refreshed about when you would have had this conversation? Yes. Could you tell the jury when? Um, um, uh, I, again, I don't know the exact date, but it was on the Friday of that same week. Okay. And um, can you tell the jury um, the phone conversation, it was actually with the defendant? Yes, sir, it was. Can you tell the jury, what did he say? Uh, we, we had a uh, conversation about uh, a friend of mine purchasing uh, the SUV, the, the uh, Expedition, the Ford Expedition. The one that was involved in this incident? Yes, sir. And during that conversation, um, did you learn whether or not the defendant actually had um, regained um, custody of the SUV at that time? 
from the police? He, uh, yes, sir. What did he tell you? That that uh, he had the SUV and that it was uh, hidden at um, at James Hughes' house. Who was James Hugh? Uh, James Hugh is a, uh, a, a friend and a, uh, a, 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 a many of the, the, the people, I mean myself, Mr. Corey, uh, Tex, Diane, he's a, uh, he's kind of a, he's a handyman, he, he, uh, he, he works for uh, us, uh, I mean, works for the Corey companies part time. He he cleans our offices, but he's all he, he does uh, detail work on cars. Uh, okay. He's a he's a jack of all trades. Okay. And um, did the defendant tell you why he had the car hidden down at James Hughes' house? Uh, to uh, keep the press from. All right, so testimony there from a co-worker of the victims. There he's talking about the defendant's plan, apparently, to sell off assets, including the car where the shooting happened. David, that's bizarre. I mean, if you're an attorney, which you are, and a gun goes off in something that you own, you would clearly know that maybe the police are going to want to take a look at this thing. Well, it, it, it raises two issues. One, he's trying to sell off assets of his wife immediately after she dies, going to the financial aspect yeah, we've of, the, the, of the case. And other things being sold as well. Of, you know, contrary to his, the defense trying to have, uh, convince the jury that he was well off, he was financially secure, he made more money than his wife, that's been noted as well. And here you also get to almost an obstruction of justice charge against him if he knew that car was going to be used as evidence in a future trial. Yeah, you know, and of course we had another expert on the stand yesterday saying, well, he completely overstated his financial health. He had all these other financial issues. So the jury heard that. Then the jury heard a recording of the defendant basically saying, okay, um, you know, I'm still worth way more than my wife. The expert couldn't corroborate that. So, you know, who does the jury believe in this case? There's one side and then there's the other. We're going to be back with more live testimony in the Tex McIver case when we continue. You're watching Law and Crime Live on the Crime and Investigation Network. Welcome back, everybody. You're watching Law and Crime Live, and thanks again for joining us on the Crime and Investigation Network. It looks like we've got a sidebar that just started seconds ago in the Tex McIver case out of Atlanta, Georgia, the case of an attorney who's facing murder charges, among other charges, including witness tampering, in the death of his wife. Now, We've had a reconstructionist on the stand talking about doing 3D reconstructions of some of the critical scenes in this case. David Icebrook is an attorney in New York City. He's a trial attorney, and he joins us now on Law and Crime to break some of this down. Now, the state's saying that this is a financial motive. It's good to have motive, but it's not necessary. So if the jurors look at all this evidence about bank accounts and wills and, and just look at it and say, hey, look, these people were just financially messy. They had a lot of money and a little money, and they made a lot of money, and they spent a lot of money, but we don't know if we buy the motive. They don't have to buy the motive. They could still convict without it. They certainly can. And, you know, very easy to get an indictment. An indictment doesn't mean a conviction. An indictment doesn't necessarily mean the prosecution has enough evidence to convict. An indictment merely means that charge charges can be brought based on the circumstances and the evidence that were presented to the grand jury at that time. Um, again, a very tough case. Financial motive, you know, is the only motive they can play here. It's the only card they really have is that he was looking for his wife's money. Now, she, uh, my understanding is she doesn't, she didn't have a life insurance policy naming him as a beneficiary, so he wasn't after that. But there certainly are other assets, and presumably a loan that the wife gave to the husband for about three hundred fifty thousand dollars that he could have been looking, you know, to get um, out of as well. Yeah, this is a really complex financial arrangement. They married later in life. They owned property together but he had loaned money from her that was apparently secured by his half interest in property they owned together and it, it just gets really really messy the testimony has just come out in long drawn out sessions and and i don't know if the prosecution is connecting the dots as well as it needs to no there are little nuggets coming in you know here and there from different witnesses there was a headhunter called the other day who testified that he was in touch with the defendant over the last 
eight or nine years to possibly place him um, with a larger firm through a merger um, or an acquisition in, in the Atlanta area. And his testimony was relevant because it came out that supposedly the defendant was not making the amount of money that he claimed to be making in terms of this merger possibility. So, you know, one little nugget there is maybe he didn't have as much as they would like him, uh, everyone to think that he had, the defendant would like to think that, that he had. And again, you know, other pieces came in about, you know, the loan, the separate assets, um, the fact that, as you said, they got married later in life, but they really didn't, they really seemed to be a, uh, a firewall of their assets. Yeah, we've got that whole issue. We've got the assets issue, and uh, the state has uh, got to prove intent, not necessarily motive. What's the difference between the two? Well, the, the intent is showing that he had, you know, the, the, the mens rea or the intent that he knew what he was doing. He planned, the, he planned it. doesn't necessarily have to be premeditated. It depend, depends what the charge is at the time, but we'll go into more detail later. Yeah, we've got to go back to court. It looks like questioning is resuming again, the Tex McIver case in Atlanta, Georgia. It looks like we have a sidebar here, folks, in the Tex McIver case out of Atlanta, Georgia. David Icebrook is a trial attorney here in New York City. David, this is an interesting detail that's uh, come up, that on some of these weapons, you can measure the, the distance that the firing pin uh, creates uh, in an indent on the bullet, and that the depth of that indent can indicate whether the gun was uh, cocked or uncocked when it was fired. Of course, one way it's easier to pull the trigger, the other way it's harder. The attorney said in the police interrogation, that is Tex McIver's attorney, said that the gun was not cocked, meaning it would have been about six times harder to pull the trigger. So how does a gun go off accidentally? Much more difficult, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, case to make. These are, you know, very minutiae points that are being brought out. And, the, you know, the jury's got to, you know, pay attention. They've got to keep the jury on this. But my personal opinion is the jury's probably made up their mind whether they think he fired it intentionally or not. Yeah. Um, we wish we had this measurement, but on this gun, the measurement just didn't work. So it's not as clear of a piece of evidence as it would be uh, perhaps in another trial with another gun. I think it's going to be interesting here to see if the jurors have questions of this witness as well and see what they're concentrating on and see what they're interested in. Yeah, I'm curious as well because, uh, look, this is a guy who had the weapon. He handled the weapon. He photographed the weapon. He showed us all the pictures of the interior of the car yet again. This is really the crux of the case. The financial motive stuff that we heard earlier this week uh, would be helpful if the state could prove it, but it's really complex, and it's not necessary under the, the law in that state to prove premeditation. They just have to prove intent. Absolutely. They're not going to go near, nor do they need to prove motive here. I don't think their financial records are going to be nearly as important to the jury in deciding whether he fired this gun intentionally. Yeah, we're still in the midst of the sidebar in the uh, Tex McIver case. So we want to continue our analysis here as we wait for a court to come back in session. Our understanding is, is that the trial was going to run until 6 p.m. Eastern today, so we're expecting it to run that late. Uh, but, David, it's been a day of competing experts, more or less. We've had a couple of reconstructionists. We had a 3D uh, version of this uh, vehicle where the shot was fired. That was up on the screen earlier and uh, basically indicated, uh, and we'll take a look at it again here, that the gun could have been held one of a couple of ways based on the trajectory of the bullet. What's interesting about that reconstruction is that it shows the defendant's finger on the trigger. And the defendant said in the interrogation, that is at the police station, not long after this happened, that he claimed his hands were clasped in his lap uh, and that the gun went off somehow, like when they hit a bump. That was one version of the story. Well, I don't know if it's the competing witnesses because they're all being called by the prosecution. True. However, True. Um, the, the graphics are telling. It's, it's just amazing what you can do with the graphic artistry these days and the reconstruction. You know, a few years ago, the jury just had to imagine in their mind what happened. Here they're being shown the likelihood of what happened. They can actually visualize it. They can see where his hands were. They can see the height of the gun in relation to where it entered in, in, into the victim's back. Um, so they're actually, you know, seeing it as closely as it actually happened without being there. And these witnesses, you know, whether they're the gun experts or the reconstruction experts, they're really giving them a bird's eye view. And again, hate to be repetitive, it's going to come down to whether they believe he shot his wife intentionally. What should they believe? Uh, if uh, David Iceberg was on the jury, what would David Iceberg say? I would think it would be a very high hurdle.
Um, it's a non-answer answer, but no, that's okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not done yet. I haven't been shy about predicting outcomes in the uh, past trials that I've been fortunate enough to sit in on. Um, you would have to believe that the um, you know the wife passed the gun to the husband at his request because that's how the gun presumably got to the back seat. I believe um, you're going to have to believe that he thought that the gun would penetrate the um, seat in the in the correct place. Now again. Maybe he wasn't. His intent was not to murder her. Maybe it was again aggravated assault is a, a lesser included crime here. All you have to do is show that he intent to fire the, the gun, not necessarily intent to kill her. Um, I think there are too many hurdles. I'd be surprised if he wasn't acquitted. Well, at least on the top charge, you've also got the witness tampering charge. He asked the driver of that vehicle, who is not present in that reconstruction that you're looking at right now. The driver's seat's empty. But the friend of uh, both the victim and the defendant was driving that vehicle when this gun went off. And she testified. Um, you know, she also testified that when she was back at the hospital, the defendant, Tex McIver, whose caricature we see in this reconstruction in the back seat, told her to just tell the authorities that she came on her own volition to support the family. And then she said back to him, Tex, that's not what happened. I can't lie. That's going to be a tough hurdle to get over, but it looks like we're back into live testimony. Let's go back to the Tex McIver case in Atlanta, Georgia. Here on the back actually unzips from both sides, lifted it up, and then that's the plastic piece that I was referring to where uh, this red circle is showing where the bullet hole went into the plastic, perforated that piece of plastic. And then next slide shows uh, this is the trajectory rod as it comes across the front seat. So this is the front right seat right here, and then a measurement up from the front right floorboard up to where the uh, trajectory rod. And what is that height? That is actually uh, one foot nine inches to the tip of the rod, and that's basically how high it was at the front edge of the seat. And then uh, this is just showing what we did is put a uh, Protractor. This protractor is aligned with the, the, the plane at the back of the seat, and then you can see the, the angle of the uh, the rod. So this edge of the protractor right here would be straight into the back of the seat, like that. Okay, and so you actually have here instead of a, a right to left angle that's about 15 degrees from off of the straight in, uh, it's moving right to left, and then. This slide is showing the angle finder placed on here, again showing that this, uh, as you move from the back of the vehicle toward the front, that the rod is moving uh, upward at an angle of about 2.4 degrees. That's approximately what the angle would be based on how that rod is positioned in there and where it centers in those holes. And then the next slide is showing uh, the seat just to show the, the distance between the, the back of the seat so that this tape is coming straight off the rear seat up to the, the back of the front seat and you can see the distance there is about uh, nine inches. And then next and slide. In, and in that previous slide, when you measure the back of the seat, um, the rear pocket is not extended with a, like a wire bow or anything. That, that is correct. This is just showing that uh, at this point this pocket is empty, and so that's basically the space that would be there, assuming nothing in the pocket. Okay. Assuming. Nothing in the pocket. Okay. Okay. And and what does this photograph show? This is with the trajectory rod in place. This is where I sat down in the vehicle to just, again, to get a sense of where the tra trajectory rod points. Oh, well, how close did you measure? No, I, I don't have an exact measurement. Did anybody scan it? <laughs> I, I don't know. Did you tell anybody to scan it? No. Um, did you review this particular? Um, this is slide 54. Did you review it? Yes, I have. Right. The, the right hand elbow of the model that you have in your slide 54. Um, you're looking down, but no door. 
The crime scene reconstruction expert is under cross-examination right now, and the defense has gotten a couple of good zingers in here, David. Right now they're talking about exactly what effect this grocery store bag would have had on the bullet coming out of the gun and the gunshot residue and things like that. Bottom line, this weapon was wrapped up in this bag, and the prosecution made a big stink not too long ago about the trajectory of the gun and whether or not the defendant's story about having his hands kind of semi-clasped in his lap fit with the trajectory. This expert said no, he, he couldn't have been telling the truth in the police interrogation because his finger would have had to have been on the trigger and the gun would have had to have been over here. But what I didn't get a lot of out of there is, well, what if this bag was so tightly wrapped around the gun that the bag called it to, caused it to go off? I mean, could that be another possibility here? Well, Aaron, I personally have a hard time believing that a bag or the movement of this gun inside the car could have made it go off um, when, the, when the wife, the victim, passed it to her husband. Uh, the defense is also basing, um, and the prosecution for that matter, um, the trajectory of the gun based on the interview of the defendant when he was uh, first questioned by the police and they, they showed a photo of him uh, in the interrogation room. Um, and anyone could you know, hold their hand within three inches or two inches of the actual position um, when it, when it um, fired in the car. Nobody really knows what the actual position was. Everybody knows that it was fired. It went through the lower portion of the seat. It entered her back and it ultimately killed her. Um, will the jury ultimately care what exactly the position of his hands were at that moment? I'm not so sure about that. Well, look, I mean, if his hands were clasped, then theoretically they weren't wrapped around the trigger and he wasn't intentionally pulling the trigger to intentionally kill someone. True. Again, you'd have to believe that the gun went off by itself without the defendant touching it at all. Um, and we've heard that story before in, in other trials. We've seen it on TV and movies. Um, guns don't typically fire by themselves. Uh, it's a hole that the defense is trying to punch in this expert story. Yes, uh, guns usually don't go off by themselves, and defendants certainly try to punch holes in prosecution stories. I'm kind of wondering about these animations that we saw play out in court this afternoon. The animations make it look pretty clear, at least in the theory of the animator, that the defendant had his finger on the trigger and was aiming that gun right straight through the front seat. I mean, this makes it look as intentional as it can get. They claim, the animators claim, that there's one of two ways that this could have happened. Either the gun was sideways on the seat, okay, as we see right there, or that it might have been a little bit further down sort of uh, on the hip. But these animations make it look like this guy intentionally pulled the trigger. But that's the animator's theory. Well, it sure does. But let's remember that the animator or the expert is the prosecution's expert. We are going to see, presumably, the defense expert come in to contradict whatever the prosecution's expert said. You may see a different graphic. You may see a different trajectory. Uh, the defense expert is obviously going to try to convince the jury that his hands were in a position where it couldn't have been fired and it was an accident. This is a trial of almost nonstop experts, it seems. A lot of trials, we have eyewitnesses. We have... Uh, other people somehow related to the case, uh, sometimes uh, more police officers than not. You know, here, not a lot of police officers other than a couple of interrogators. It's been investigators. Uh, it's been people looking at and interpreting evidence. One eyewitness and uh, a lot to unravel for this jury. So let's go back live to the Tex McIver case in Atlanta. Exhibit number 13. Um, can you tell the jury, based on your analysis, um, was the muzzle of the gun that was discharged inside of this vehicle, was it pointed at the back of Diane McGuire? Yes. Um, Mr. Harvey talked to you a whole lot about gunshot residue and, um, is there a difference between gunshot residue and gunpowder residue? It, right, there's, there are two types of uh, gunshot residue, one being gunshot primer residue, that's residues that come from the detonation of the primer, and then there's gunshot powder residue, which comes from unburned and partially burned powder particles that are being forced out of the barrel and, and then a revolver also through the cylinder gun. Okay, the photographs that you received that were taken by the Atlanta Police Department. Um, 
When do you understand those photos were taken by the Atlanta Police Department? Uh, they were taken sometime shortly after the shooting. Is it in the, and is it in those photos wherein you believe that they're the gray particular matter? Yes. Okay. And then let me ask you this: Do you know whether or not the vehicle was actually released back to the defendant after that? It, it's my understanding that it was. Okay. And then you came to Atlanta in February. That's correct. And then you looked at the vehicle then? Yes. And did you see the same gray particulate matter on the back of the seat that you saw in the photos that were taken by APD right after the incident? No. Um, do you know who a man named James Hugh is? You know who that is? No. 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 Um, Based on your experience and expertise, can you tell the jury, is there any reason you can think of why someone would fire a gun while it was inside of a plastic public bag? Let me answer that. Really? really? That's my legal objection. That's my legal basis. There's that. Right. I sustain, I'm not on the really part, but I don't think that, um, expert or not, this is a, a witness to speculate whether there's a good reason to shroud a gun in a plastic bag before firing. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Jurors, any questions for our witness, Mr. Knox? Deputy, if you wouldn't mind collecting those cards, we will process those. And Thank you, sir. A sidebar in the Tex McIver case in Atlanta, Georgia. David Iceberg, local attorney here in New York City, remains with me on Law and Crime analyzing this case. Uh, David, we just had an objection there because the state wanted to ask this witness, who's a trajectory guy, if there was a good reason to wrap a gun up in a grocery store bag, and the defense is like, wait a minute, this isn't this guy's expertise. That's not for him to get into. And the judge turned around and said, yeah, I agree, and didn't let him answer. Now, sometimes the question has power for the jury regardless of whether there's an answer and an attorney just kind of want to wants to plant that seed in the minds of the jurors is that possibly what happened here absolutely aaron it was on redirect by the prosecution they wanted to get the question out was there any reason why he would have had the gun in a plastic bag it wasn't within his scope of expertise the judge was going to um, sustain the objection which he did but the jury still heard the question yeah we're going to continue to monitor the situation live in the tex mciver courtroom in atlanta georgia Normally, jurors get to ask questions, and we might be at that point. We will continue to keep an eye on it for you. We're going to take a brief break for now. We'll be back live here on Law & Crime in just a few moments. Welcome back, everybody. You're watching Law & Crime Live, and welcome again to those of you watching on the Crime and Investigation Network. Jury questions for this reconstruction expert. Let's go back live to the Tex McIver case. That question makes sense. So floorboard of vehicle to the top, where the bottom of your thigh would be resting. Uh, I can answer that question if I can look back at some photographs that I have. Sure, we'll get those to you with follow up. You guys can get those photos. These yeah. would be photos from your um, uh, presentation. I don't think it's in the presentation. I have uh, some of the photographs that I took. I have them with me, and I can refer to those and answer that question. Okay. Any objection as long as you guys see these photos? Yes, an objection. Yes. Are they things you relied upon in preparing your report and your analysis? Yes. It's part of the, all the photographs and measurements that I took. Okay. Uh, let's come back to that in a minute. Um, do you know um, how tall the gun is, meaning if I rested the gun on a table with the butt of the gun on the table, how, what the height is from butt of gun to the top of the frame. 
I don't know that measurement off the top of my head. Um, I can kind of approximately, you're looking at about this much distance, so maybe in the uh, four or five inches range, but I don't know the exact measurement. Okay. Um, should we talk at the side about um, Mr. Knox looking at a photo of his collection? Okay. Mm -hmm. Jury questions there for the reconstruction expert in the Tex McIver trial. This is that point, David, when the attorneys really are listening to these questions because the jurors get to ask questions. We can see into the, the minds of the jurors. We get a sense of what they're thinking. Absolutely. And as I mentioned before, this is the first time or the one of the rare instances you really get into the insight um, or um, the thoughts of the jurors. Uh, where they're going, where the thoughts are, where they're leading, who they're, lis who they're listening to. And these questions come back as they want to know about the position of the gun, the height of the gun. They want to know if it's reasonable that if he was holding it in his lap, it could have entered in that position of the seat. Yeah, I think we're going to get some follow-up questions now, so let's go back to the courtroom. Uh, we've established that if, that if it's sideways, upright, whatever it might be, the only thing that has to be in line with the trajectory is the muzzle, correct? That's correct. How far below the muzzle is the trigger? The trigger is below the muzzle. A couple of inches. Yeah. Right. So in your picture, if you have your finger where the muzzle would be at the trajectory, it would actually be lower. Your finger would be lower because the muzzle would be two inches higher, right? That's correct. If your finger okay. was aligned with the trajectory, then the actual trigger finger would be lower. Exactly. 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 And if you are measuring the, the distance between the, um, the trajectory rod and where somebody's lap might be, there are a couple of factors that you need to know. Not somebody's height and weight, but how big their legs are, for example. That would make a difference. That would make a difference. Yes. Okay. And, and how much the seat may may go down if you when you sit on the seat it it, it contracts it. All right so a couple of things we just don't know you can't tell us how far the seat contracts how big somebody's thigh is and um, the distance between where it might be and where the trigger is as opposed to where the muzzle is correct those are things that we you didn't take into consideration well, as to the last part, the, the, take the defense gets to recross this witness after the jury questions. The defense asking some good points. Hey, did the reconstruction account for Tex McIver's actual height, weight, the size of his legs? It, it, was this all figured into things? That's important to know whether or not that reconstruction is accurate. But uh, I want to ask you, David, this other interesting thing happened. Sometimes we become part of the trial. The defense used a screen grab of the Law and Crime Network showing the prosecutor's opening statement where the prosecutor was motioning outward, uh, you know, with arm extended. And I'm pointing away from David, not Adam here, saying this is how the shot was fired. And the defense used that to ask the expert, is that how you think the shot was fired? And the expert said, no. So why did the prosecutor use that motion in the opening statement? Well, first of all, you need to get your logo on the um, picture so we, we, you get the promo yeah, value yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. But second of all, he's using information that was taken directly from the trial, a picture taken directly from the trial to discredit the prosecution. And my guess is that picture is coming back out in his closing argument. Yeah, I expect it. We're going to wrap up the broadcast day, though, here on the Law and Crime Network. This case might push a little bit past six o'clock. You can keep watching on our website. For now, this is Aaron Keller, and for everybody here at Law & Crime, have a good evening.